Barbecue. Hello and welcome to another Boost Booze and Barbecue. This is Andy, and man, I am excited for today's episode. I got a chance to sit down and talk with J.P. Alonzo of Edge Autosport. He was kind enough to phone in. We had a nice little conversation about what they're doing over there in Colorado and what the future holds for Edge Autosport. And Really good, interesting conversation, you guys. Listening back through it as I'm putting this show together, I stop and think about all of the different people that we've had on the show recently and just this wealth of knowledge that's just been flowing out of the guests that we've been getting on the show. And I can't thank them all enough, and I can't thank JP enough. So without further ado, here is that call. JP, how are you doing, man? Good. How are you, Andy? Doing fantastic. Owner of... Edge Auto Sport. You can find them on Facebook, of course. You can find them on Instagram. The website is edgeautosport.com. Make sure you're going by there and checking them out. They got tons and tons of really cool stuff. JP, you and I have known each other for a long time. Haven't seen you in a long time. How's everything going in Colorado? Things are going great. Today was an awesome day. Speaking of just today. <laughs> Ooh. Great, great winter day in the in the or winter time day in the Denver area. So, but otherwise, in general, things are good. Edge Auto Sport. I remember you left Oregon to go and head that up in Colorado, and that's been how many years ago now? Yeah. So actually, I what the funny thing is is I I'm originally from Denver uh, and raised in Denver. I moved to. Uh, Vancouver, Washington, which is, you know, as basically kind of a, a suburb of, of Portland almost. I mean, it is obviously a different state and city, but it's Portland metro area, right? So I actually moved to Vancouver uh, because my wife is from there. At the time, she was my girlfriend. So I started the company before I moved out there. Um, I moved back to Denver because I needed a shop and that was always the plan once once I needed space, you know, if everything went well and, and the company took off enough, um, you know, I would I would move back to Denver because that's that's the place that I wanted the company to to be. So Right. Um so yeah, that's that's why I came back out to Denver's because I needed space. I had I had way too much uh <laughs> way too many car parts sitting in my garage <laughs> in an unsecured location, you know, it was a, <laughs> yeah. a little sketchy there. Oh, I hear that, especially in, uh, well, in that particular area. I mean, nobody likes to talk bad about their <laughs> right. town yeah. they live in, but you know, Hey, right before I moved out of Portland, our parting gift to Portland was to have uh, a homeless person break into our garage and steal eh, $3,000 worth of tools. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a few weeks before um, people, we moved. People are nice like that these days, you know. Right? Uh, just help your fellow man to, you know, all of your own stuff. <laughs> right. So you guys obviously really started blowing up, and then you made your way back to Colorado so that you could get your own shop going, right? Yeah. And since then... You have worked with Mazda Speeds, you have worked with Focus STs, the Focus RS, EcoBoost vehicles. You guys have an all-wheel drive dyno now, which I feel like was a fairly recent addition, right? Yeah, we got it installed. God, that's a that's a that could be a really really long story. The uh getting the dy get, just getting the dyno and getting it operating. I'll I'll save that for another day, but um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we got it. I want to say, I want to say August is when we really started running it, mm. August or September, something like that. So a few months ago. And since then, I mean, you guys have had all kinds of stuff on there. I was perusing your Facebook page the other day and you guys had a 1300 and some odd horsepower GTR run on your dyno. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in all fairness, we were not tuning that car. Uh, he was getting a, a remote tune done by, by somebody actually in the Middle East, I think. So, but he was using our dyno. So that was pretty cool to have that car in there. That is very cool. Very cool. Well, you needed that all wheel drive dyno though, because the Focus RS came around and obviously that was an instant tuner classic and everybody right. wanted to see if they could push the limits with that car. You guys have embraced that 
side of the motorsport world. I don't know if there's a there's a better way for me to say that, but I feel like the Mazda Speed Cars and the Focus ST and RSs share some similarities there that maybe allowed you to cross platform a bit. Am I wrong? Oh yeah, that's that's a hundred percent correct. I mean that's yeah, to kind of be more specific, we started off in Mazda Speed. I kind of had a personal interest in Mazda Speed threes myself. And so, you know, when I started the company and kind of knew what I wanted to do uh, with it, I, I just used the Mazda Speed 3 as kind of my entry platform. And it worked out really well. And I mean, it, it was nice because they're kind of one of the early adopters of direct injection from a production standpoint. You know, VW did that uh, fairly early on. But that Mazda Speed 3, you know, and the Speed 6 as well, I mean, from a global standpoint, I think the Speed 6 came out uh, in 2005 in places like Australia and Europe. So that was pretty early on for, you know, turbocharged direct injection performance type of platforms to be coming out. Mm -hmm. So naturally, uh, just being in Mazda Speed, we, we got to know direct injection really well and just that type of platform. Uh, that's really, you know, the major difference between that and, and other cars like it. And so it's pretty natural to to get into the EcoBoost world. The the funny thing is, I mean, a lot of people know this already, but I'm sure a lot of people don't. You know, the Mazda Speed 3 is a Ford platform. It's it's mm -hmm. it's basically a Ford chassis and a Ford motor. I mean, it's it's all, you know, FOMOCO is stamped all over the car. And correct so, me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the Focus and the Mazda 3 chassis were actually borrowed in large from Volvo. Am I wrong? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they share a lot of the same suspension components and, um, you know, just all sorts of things. So it's it's essentially a, a rebranded platform mm -hmm. um, for Mazda, so... Which, you know, they've moved away from that. The, the Mazda 3 now is is a Mazda, but, you know, the first and second generations were really Ford-based vehicles. Well, you're looking at an economical vehicle that's very reliable, uh, has good marks, has high ratings, was not terribly expensive when it was brand new. The only way to do that is to, to cross those platforms like that. Right. And, you know, there are manufacturers even now that are just adopting that that way of doing things. And while I do appreciate when manufacturers spend all this extra time making their own vehicles specifically for them, you know, there is something to be said about going and getting something proven from another company and using it across all platforms and then, you know, sharing that information to better that singular platform. But, right. you know, as a purist, I am happy to hear that Mazda was like, oh, hey, this thing is selling. Let's take the reins back, you know. Yeah. What's it been like working with the direct injection motors? From a tuning standpoint, direct injection is, I mean, it is a newer technology on the production side of things, but there's no, uh, the bottom line is there's really no aftermarket fuel systems that you're able to just plug in. You know, for example, you know, on a Subaru or an Evo or, you know, any given popular platform like that. Well, and the WRX from 2015 on is, is, direct injection show it so it shares some of the same challenges as you know the Mazda speeds do but but any port injected vehicle you know you can you replace the fuel pump you replace fuel rails fuel injectors uh you know there's a wide variety of of aftermarket support and aftermarket components in order to increase the amount of fuel that you can send into the engine and just keep raising horsepower throw a bigger turbo at it you know build the engine put huge injectors in there and make a bunch of horsepower but in direct injection, if you go do a search for aftermarket direct injection fuel injectors, you won't find any really. I mean, they're, they're out there, but it's in its infancy right now in the aftermarket. I mean, I'm not I'm not an engineer. I don't know what goes into making a fuel injector per se, but I do know that it's a much more complicated injector. You're dealing with, you know, in the Mazda speed, you're dealing with 1600, 1700 psi of fuel pressure. Right. Whereas in a, a Subaru port injected car, you know, you're just dealing with 40, 45 base fuel pressure that rises one to one with boost. You know, so at any given point, you might have 60 or 70 PSI of, of fuel pressure in the system. But our Focus ST pump runs at 2800 PSI when you're on wide open throttle and you need all the fuel you can get. So it's a much more complicated injector. It's a much more complex injector that takes a lot more money and engineering to create and modify. And so 
the aftermarket world really hasn't caught up with that or and i don't know if they really want to and with that said the challenge is overcome by oddly enough putting <laughs> putting regular injectors in in a you know in an auxiliary form on top of the the standard in uh, di injectors that come with mm. the car so for example, on our Focus ST shop car that we have, you know, we still use the injectors that the car came with. Or actually, it, they are a different set of injectors, but they're they're basically Focus RS injectors, so they are a little bit higher flow. But then we added injector like IDE 1050 Xs. We have a set of four of them that spray fuel pre-cylinder on top of the the four DI injectors. So <laughs> you get around it by going back to older technology and just adding on a different fuel system essentially and controlling it with an auxiliary fuel controller. So anyway, going back to your original question, the challenge is the fuel system. That's really mm-hmm. it. You know, you, it still has pistons and rods and a crankshaft and it still has a cylinder head with camshafts. You know, it's there, there's nothing different about it. You know, you still put a bigger turbo on it and do all the same stuff, but the fuel system is really where the major, major differences are. Right. I remember reading about this with the Monster Speed 3s in particular. The very first modification you're supposed to do with those is the high pressure fuel pump. <laughs> yeah. Because those systems yeah. operate off of a mechanical fuel pump that's basically bumping up the pressure like a diesel engine would, right? Right, right. Yeah, because you're just you're overcoming so much pressure by injecting it into the cylinder. You know, there's a lot mm. more pressure inside the cylinder than there is in an intake manifold at any given point. So so, you know, you're you're overcoming that pressure in the cylinder, which means you need really high pressure to send that fuel in, obviously. Have Ford been able to refine that system at all, or are you finding it's pretty much the same as what you found on the first-gen Mazda Speed 3s? Has there been much change yet? The only change, really, from going specifically with those two platforms is the ECU features. The Fords have a much, much, much crazier ECU setup than the Mazdas. The Mazdas were more straightforward to tune and the Fords have a lot of different back end tables and and uh, compensations that are going on to to control the the EFI system. So that's the main difference. Otherwise, I mean it's really the same setup. Again, the Ford Focus ST is really the same exact cylinder block in the same style motor as the Mazda speeds, you know, Mazda speed three guys right now, when they're building motors, some people are starting to use Ford EcoBoost Mustang and RS crankshafts because it's the same crankshaft. I mean, it's really, there's, there's like a small difference in functionality. It, you know, it doesn't use a pilot bearing. What's I think really the main difference, the journals are all the same size and it's essentially the same crank. So it's really the same motor, honestly. That's interesting. I did not know that. I, I thought there would be some they change completely in architecture. Different cylinder heads, completely different cylinder heads, but it's it's essentially the same same style motor as the Mazda speeds. That is fascinating. I'm sure a lot of Ford Focus RS people would uh, not appreciate me <laughs> breaking that news to them that they didn't know. <laughs> Why is it then the Focus RS seems to be having more problems with like I want to say it's head gaskets? It, yeah. Um, yeah, but, I think I, I don't know a ton about that, but I, I I honestly think they were using incorrect head gaskets. I, I think that was the verdict on that. I, I'm not tuned into that situation a whole heck of a lot, but I do know they had some major head gasket issues that you know they did a recall on, and you go get a new head gasket, and Ford did fix that. But I think they were putting I think they were putting like wrong head gaskets in the cars or something like that. Hmm, that is interesting. I should have done a little more looking into that because I know it was a big issue with the the Focus RS. It became almost a meme, but then it seemed like it got sorted out right before people really freaked out about it, you know? (laughs) Right. The EcoBoost trucks went through a similar thing. The 3.5 liter V6s, the the EcoBoost, excuse me, V6s, they Uh were having head gasket issues and they were having turbo seal issues and stuff like that. So, you know, it's probably just one of those growing pains, teething pains, you know, something like that. But uh, I know that the Focus RS, the performance is undeniable. They look like they're kind of cutting edge for that technology, which I really like and I really appreciate, especially with now, you know, the Evo and the STI. Those are kind of in limbo. I think they've officially killed the 
Evo, but you know, that doesn't mean that there can't be special editions that come around. That always seems to happen, <laughs> right. you know, but I feel like the Focus RS is kind of filling that niche where if a person wants a compact turbo four cylinder all wheel drive car, like we've had from the Evos and the STIs for a long time, the mm-hmm. Focus RS is now going to be their main focus, pun intended. Yeah, and what's interesting about the Focus platform, whether you're talking about ST or RS, is it's a Ford. So there's a lot more people interested in it than, you know, a Subaru or a Mitsubishi or the, all the cliche tuner cars out there. You know, we have customers that are 65-year-old guys wanting to put a bigger turbo on their on their Focus, and we have the 18-year-old kids that it's one of their first cars that, that they get, and of course they want to modify it. But, I mean, there's a whole <laughs> range of, of people that, like that car and that drive that car and want to modify that car it's a it's a really really wide range where you you won't see that in a mazda speed 3 you know not nearly as much you know you don't you you see a lot more younger guys and a more more cliche group of people Mm -hmm. modifying and, and buying that car than an st or an rs well, they found a very similar thing, Dodge did anyways, with the Neon SRT4 and right. even their Dodge Omni GLH and GLHS. I mean, those things ended up having like a like a midlife following for guys because it was this compact car and they, for whatever reason, wanted to have a compact car, but they also wanted to go fast, you know. So it's a similar thing happening now that happened back then. Right. And speaking of cars to drive, what are you driving these days? <laughs> well, it depends on the day, I guess. <laughs> Ooh, I'm jealous I of have, that answer. Uh, I have all, you know, I have a bunch of projects sitting around, and the funny thing is, I the car I drive most often is my Ford F350 diesel. <laughs> I bought that a few years ago to tow around these other cars. I have a trailer, and you know, whenever I want to go to the racetrack, I tow it out there. So that's what I drive most of the time, but. You know, I have the Ford Focus ST. Uh, we bought that brand new in 2013. That's not at all practical to drive anymore, but, uh, you know, I take that out every once in a while. Why is and, that uh, not practical to drive anymore? <laughs> well, ours, ours, the last time we had it on the dyno, which is a few weeks ago, you know, it, I think it made somewhere around 610 or 620 to the wheel. And uh, Ooh. Ooh. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. It's it's a 2.3 liter. It's a stroked ST motor, basically, it, it has the like the Mustang EcoBoost or the Ford Focus RS crankshaft in it, and it's got you know some custom pistons and you know camshafts and auxiliary fuel and better valve train. It revs and it's loud and it's noisy and it's uncomfortable and <laughs> so it's it's purely a kind of a marketing vehicle at this point, which. Uh, so we, I don't, I don't really drive that thing. I'm totally with it. It's one of those cars where on street tires, you don't really have traction till fourth gear. I, I get it. Right, and front wheel <laughs> drive. I mean, the thing is, if you floor it in third gear, you go nowhere. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so that's your shop car. What else have we got? Yeah, well, I got a 2013 WRX sedan that is. Uh, I'm currently replacing a fuel system on. Speaking of of doing that sort of thing still on stock turbo. So I, I would prefer that to be kind of my daily performance car as soon as I'm done getting that fuel system all hooked up. And then I got, we have a shop Civic SI, that new turbo, that uh, 2017 year model. In hindsight, I, I probably didn't have the time to really do anything with that car and promote it and try to sell parts for that platform. There's so many things going on at the company. But we have that sitting around that we're going to start tinkering with here pretty soon. And, um, I have a Mazda Speed 3 as well. I bought that last year or maybe earlier this year or something like that just to kind of have a true daily. It, you mm-hmm. know, these are like car guy problems, right? I, I come up with excuses to cars and uh, just drive them around whenever. Uh, they, they hardly ever see any miles on the road, so... That's really funny. That that's totally a car guy problem. I mean, it's I not always, a car guy I problem that I have right tell, now. But I always try to convince myself that I'm going to use it for the company and for promotion, and then you know, I, I use it probably about twenty percent is what I thought I would use it for. <laughs> yeah, that's the way. That's the way this always works. It, it always goes that way. You know, it's like when you're out to lunch with you know your tuner. And you go, hey, let's talk business for five minutes. And you keep all those receipts, right? <laughs> right. 
It's the same thing, you know, you're just using it in a little different way. I like that. Well, yeah, that Subaru, I mean, that's going to make a really great daily driver, especially when the snow gets there, which I assume snow has already hit, yeah? Yeah, it snowed here a few times already this year, nothing crazy, but usually kind of January, I think it starts, we start seeing more snow around here, so, yeah. It, that's when you would want... a good, better mm-hmm. car for the snow, although I probably still won't even see snow, because... I got a truck for that. You know, the truck makes driving in the snow so easy. (laughs) That's a good point. That's a really good point. And speaking of all-wheel drive for the snow, so the Mazda Speed 6s, you bought a Mazda Speed 3 here not too long ago. Just kind of keep your foot in the door with that one, right? Yeah. And then the Mazda Speed 6s, I noticed that Corksport just came out with a new front mount intercooler kit for it, which I was kind of surprised by, to be honest. I thought that the Mazda Speed 6 had kind of had its time and, and was starting to get overlooked, if you know what I mean. But it almost seems like there's now this sudden resurgence in interest in those. Have you guys seen any of that out your way? You know, I, I don't think there's been a resurgence uh, more than there was before, but, uh, you know, it's still a modifiable platform. So anybody that gets it, you know, you can do a lot of stuff to it. And so there's definitely a limited amount of them on the street. Uh, that's for sure. So, you know, Mazda speed six is, it's the same exact engine as a speed three, right? So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff you can buy for it. That's for speed three chassis stuff is where it obviously, uh, differs the most. It differs completely, which from a performance part standpoint, a front mount intercooler is obviously only going to work on a speed six, one that's made for a speed six. So something like that is you, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I don't know how worth it is to make a part like that for a car with such little numbers, but they do sell them. I mean, it's, it's Corksport in particular is very much just a Mazda shop. They, that's their pride and, and joy. And that's what they do. That's, that's their claim to fame. So, I mean, it makes sense for them to have, dang near anything Mazda, but for a company to try to jump into a Mazda Speed 6 and start making parts for it today is a little bit unrealistic, but, you know, m- way more realistic for Corksport to do something like that. Right. Oh, of course. Yeah. And then as far as Edge Autosports products are concerned, you guys do the tuning. Do you have any branded parts out there yet, or is that something that you've thought about doing? Yeah, we we don't, and I don't I don't really think we ever will. To be perfectly honest with you, I've I've kind of learned that my my specialty is retail. I, I'm good with people. I'm good with with customer service. That that's kind of where my brain is focused. Just creating a good experience for customers to come and buy the parts and do it themselves, or or take parts to a shop or something like that. You know, we're we're very much a retail company, even though we've just recently started tuning. Half the reason why we bought a dyno is is really to create content and knowledge for ourselves for the retail side of the company. That's retail side of the company is really where, where we focus and, and it's our biggest project at any given time. So we actually do not touch any customer's cars. We don't, we don't build motors. We don't work on people's cars at all. Tuning is the first thing we've stepped into in regards to working on quote unquote, somebody's car is just, just tuning. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if we'll ever go past that. You know, with that said, we're not just there to take orders. You know, I'm, I, I would consider myself at this point, well, when I started the company too, I, I have been for a long time. I, I would consider myself a car guy. I, I love learning about performance. I love upgrading my own cars and I love helping other people upgrade their cars. That's mm-hmm. so we, we do pride ourselves on having knowledge and having an understanding of what we're selling. You know, when you call us, If somebody doesn't know an answer on the phone right there, you know, we're going to find answers. We're going to talk to manufacturers. We're going to understand the concepts that it takes to help a customer modify their car. You know, we're, we're not just order takers. So we do, we do like to, to get into cars and, and understand performance, but uh, that's what we're good at. And that's the way it'll probably ever go. I do feel like we'll ever make parts. We're, we're just good at selling them. (laughs) So. I I think that's very fair. And by the way, there's a need for people who do what you do, because what makes you good at retail, I feel like, is your extraordinary knowledge of the vehicles. Sure. You've done a lot of track day racing. You've done a lot of car modifying yourself. You are a tried and true car guy gear head. I mean, you will get in there and you will get your hands dirty and it's not a problem for you. And, And I have no doubt that that is what makes you guys 
guys such as successful retailers because you know what questions to ask. You know, a customer calls up and they say, we have this problem with our, this part. And you have an idea of what that part does and where it goes and what their issue could be. So right. that is definitely not something to discount or discredit. I mean, that is what makes you guys the retailer to go to for these parts. Yeah. And I mean, even just as an example, I'm, I'm currently in the process of trying to hire a, a warehouse guy to pack and ship parts and process orders and things like that. And one of the questions that I address with them almost right off the bat is how into cars are they? What are they into? What experience do they have with aftermarket and performance? And not that I'm looking for a specific answer. You know, I, I don't need somebody to be, you know, a parts engineer or a race car driver or a, a current wrencher of anything to hire them. But I can't have somebody talking to a customer that has no interest in cars at all. That would exactly. uh, you know, obviously be a bad representation of the company. So, I mean, I, I hire people that, that are into cars. I mean, that's as simple as I can put it, that you got to have some sort of interest in cars. The amount of people that we have or are going to have in the immediate future, they all need to be at least somewhat interested in cars. It, it only makes sense. So, Yeah, 100% agree. We've all worked at those jobs where you had people who didn't know, didn't care about what they were doing. <laughs> right. And they just didn't. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, I work in an automation firm, right? And it's no different there. I mean, you get certain people who it's pretty obvious that they're not super interested in what they're doing, if you know what I mean. Right. And it sucks. It sucks to talk to somebody like that. I mean, it's uh, you can tell you, you almost wish you never started the conversation, right? You almost wish you just went somewhere else the second they start talking <laughs> mm -hmm. because it's hard to deal with somebody that that isn't reciprocating that that knowledge and that that same energy that you have for for what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's one of the, the best parts about Edge Autosport. Is that kind of what brought you into that realm? Was you were a car guy that liked to sell things? Or how how did that made up of Edge Autosports with JP happen? Yeah, so the story behind the company is I started the company when I was 23. And I came from the sales and customer service world. I, I jumped around trying to sell a lot of different products while, while I was young. I never went to college. But instead, I sold cars, I sold insurance, I sold mortgages, I <laughs> I cut my teeth in the sales world, um, in the transaction world. Uh, that world wasn't for me. Um, I, I love talking to people. I love uh, I love transactions. I love doing business, but selling things just wasn't my uh, my niche. But it taught me a ton. It taught me a lot about how to deal with people and how to sell things and just how, how business operates. Mm -hmm. And I had this interest in cars since I was in high school, really. Um, you know, I never really was able to pursue anything with a car specifically in high school. I didn't have money. My parents, you know, didn't do anything with cars. I, you know, I, I, I didn't have that privilege when I was in high school. So I had to wait until I was out working to buy my own stuff and start doing my own modifying of, of anything that I had. So through that time, uh, you know, I talked to a handful of companies here and there, and it was just a common theme. Everybody just sucks to talk to, honestly. I've kind of come to the conclusion that a lot of these companies that make parts and work on cars, they're these, they're these really talented people with cars and engineering and whatever else they do, but they're terrible at talking to people, mm -hmm. and they're terrible at serving customers. And I go, man, I mean, I... I'm really good at that. <laughs> I'm really good at talking to people and, and making sure people are happy and giving them a good experience. And I have this side interest of cars. And I mean, I always knew that I wanted to start my own company. There was a handful of things that I had an interest in starting from a young age, but cars was, was one of them. And I finally just said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to start my own company. I'm going to, I'm going to show other companies how this is done and how you can talk to customers and, and what kind of loyalty you can garner from these people by being awesome to them, unlike anything I've ever experienced. And I mean, it worked. It's it. It was fairly simple. Uh, I think there was some good timing involved. Uh, I think the Mazda Speed community was a great one to join. In hindsight, I, I understand why I was able to to do that in Mazda Speed more than I did when I first started the company. It was a very underserved community, even for how small it was. 
you know, you, you talk about a Subaru platform or, or Ford, obviously, you, like, you know, the Mustang community, for example, there's no shortage of aftermarket companies and parts for that car. Well, Mazda Speed wasn't like that. There, there was a shortage of really, really good companies serving that community. So, you know, that's that's how I think I was able to come up as quickly as I did. You know, I say that I I didn't go full time with the company until over two years after starting it. So it took a while. But, you know, that community was just underserved from a retail uh, standpoint. There wasn't there wasn't a great, great company that was kind of the face of Mazda Speed um, from a retail standpoint. And my knowledge of how to deal with people and, you know, serve a customer really I mean, it, it allowed us to just jump in head first and and really start kicking butt and, and getting some customers. So that's that's my background. That's how Edge started is I, I personally got sick of dealing with some of these companies that acted like they didn't care about my money. And mm-hmm. uh, I say, you know what, there's space for me in this uh, in this industry. And that's how Edge began. It's that classic see a need, fill a need. Yeah. It's a really important to be able to identify when those opportunities come. And uh, right. I have to say, you're smarter than the average bear for seeing that, recognizing that there was an opening there, and then taking charge and doing it. I mean, your success isn't just good timing. It was the wherewithal to know when you were in the right place and when it was good timing. So good on you for that. That's really incredible. Not just a story. That's a life lesson. I'm going to have my nephew listen to this episode. I think he's going to get a lot out of it. (laughs) (laughs) So coming back around to the cars that you work on, I am always curious whenever I talk to guys that own a shop, what has been one of the more interesting Maybe it was a build that you got to be part of because a person was buying all the parts through you or the most interesting car that you've had come in to tune. Do you have anything that's coming to the top of your head? Well, specifically with the dyno, we had a uh, gosh, it's actually really weird when you have a dyno, what just ends up walking into your shop that you just normally would never even consider a would be customer, right? The other day we had a Jaguar XJ. What are the, I don't even know what they what those things are. Those older front engine V12. Like what are they? XJ something. I don't know. Yeah, there's um, the XJS. I think it is. Yeah, I'm I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Just it's mm-hmm. a really long bodied front engine performance <laughs> quote unquote Jaguar car. You know, which back in the day it it, it was a performance car. You know, it made like something like high 100s or low 200s horsepower it's a v12 you know it's <laughs> yeah. from the late 80s or whatever when nothing made power from the factory and uh so that was interesting we've had a uh we had a pontiac fiero come and these guys are just doing baseline pulls on the dyno right they're just they're just wanting to see what their car makes so yeah. you know we had a a guy with a fiero come in and and <laughs> it was just fun to see a fiero do a pull on the dyno i've always thought that you know car was just kind of a a funny car, interesting car. So, well, heck yeah. I mean, that, that car is awesome because you've got two <laughs> K cars, just the fronts of them, and you mash them together, and then you put a seat in the middle. Like, that's it's brilliant. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of a cool little car. I think some people don't really take it seriously. And, I mean, I don't really take it seriously, but it's just a neat car. It's a car that, you know, historically, there's not a whole lot of stuff out there like that. And it was, it was cool that it was even made. I mean, for any, I don't know much about the car, but I'm sure there's reasons why they didn't keep making it. (laughs) (laughs) I uh, think the reasons are M, R, and (laughs) 2. That's, yeah, it's definitely one of them. When Toyota decides to do something like that, they'll quickly put others to shame in, in whatever they go after. So I could be crazy, but I'm pretty sure I read that Ford was making their own mid engined car like that because once they saw Toyota and Pontiac get on board, you know, the Fiero and the MR2 trying to du- duke it out. I'm pretty sure Ford said that they wanted to get into it until they saw the decline of the interest in the Fiero and then they scrapped it. But the motor that they had specially designed for it was actually that Yamaha V6 that ended up in the Ford Taurus SHO. I'm pretty sure that was originally meant for a mid-engine car to rival the MR2, but then Ford lost interest and and they had to do something with the motor because all this development went into it. And so they made that special edition Taurus. That's interesting. I did not know that. Just weird stuff rattling around my head that nobody else cares (laughs) about, you know? (laughs) Yeah. 
you had an Audi go across your dyno here not too long ago, right? Yeah. If you're referring to the one I think we posted about it on Facebook is a RS3, I want to say. It was like a gray one. Yeah. Yeah, those things are gnarly. I had, I mean, I I think there's, there's so many segments to the car world that if you're deep enough into your own segment, you don't realize you end up kind of missing out on what a lot of other platforms offer. And I'll tell you what, I knew what the S3 was. I knew about that two liter, you know, the two liter turbo that they've been pumping out in those cars for years now. But I, I, I honestly had no idea that they had an, that an RS3 was a thing uh, in the States. I knew they had stuff like that over in Europe, but I, I didn't realize that they brought it into the States, let alone at and it has a five cylinder turbo, which I mean, I've, I've heard of cars with five cylinder turbos. I just didn't know that Audi had that car here. And then the thing does a pull on the dyno with some, it's got some ethanol blended fuel and it's got, you know, just some aftermarket bolt ons and some ECU flash from one of these European flasher companies. And the thing made like almost 500 to the <laughs> wheel. <laughs> and I was just like, you got to be kidding me. I'm that, that's the type of car you look at and you go, man, I'm in the wrong platform. <laughs> <laughs> Those things are burly. And when they brought the five cylinder back, and I think a lot of people were looking at it going, really? A five cylinder? Like, isn't that a little bit archaic? Because we had moved away from them, you know. But yeah. hey, what's the saying? There's no replacement for displacement. And if you can fit a five cylinder, right. you know, more power to you. And plus the sound, man. The sound is just crazy. I mean, you have just such a unique. It ends up being a, a unique combination of, of firing orders, you know, and it just it ends up being a crazy sound. Mm -hmm. It's basically half of a V10. And so it's it's almost like it's a little bit lumpy or something. You know right. what I mean? There it, There's something very Subaru esque to the sound, but it's very it's very unique. The closest I can describe it for anybody who's never heard one is think of a 2JZ that has lost a cylinder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they sound like all the time, and it is incredible yeah. sounding. I mean, some of them sound, yeah, they, they, they just really do have, for just one more cylinder, it creates quite a bit of extra just growl, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I love unique sounding engines, engines that don't, you know, you don't hear every day. Awesome V8s, awesome V6s, awesome four cylinders. They, are, they all, you know, an awesome sounding car is an awesome sounding car, but a unique sounding car has that little extra cool factor because you just don't hear it too often. That's very true. It, that's the one that's going to turn the heads as people go, right. what is it's that It's like sound? hearing a rotary, right? You hear a rotary wind up to 8,000 RPM, and it just sounds different. Well, yeah. Old ladies with their shopping bags are diving for cover. They're just going, what is that? I'm being attacked by bees. <laughs> right. <laughs> And speaking of other cars that are outside of the platforms that you work on, what is the future of Edge looking like? I mean, we've got the EcoBoost that are kind of just getting started. There are tuners out there and there, there are companies making the parts out there, but really we haven't hit the cap of what those engines are capable of yet. And so obviously you've got a lot of work ahead of you if you want to start moving towards the EcoBoost engines and stuff. But do you see Edge trying to incorporate any other cars in the future? You know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in all honesty, I, I never wanted to, I, I, you know, I'm not taking anything away from how much like Mazda speeds and EcoBoost. I, I really do love those cars. I, that Nothing about that has changed ever really. But my goal with Edge Autosport is to be multi-platform retailer. I want to become a JEGS type of, of retailer. So, you know, selling all sorts of parts for all sorts of cars, but also just selling different stuff universally, uh, fittings, turbos, you know, just stuff for cars that that all guys all performance applications can use so from a platform standpoint i think it's not wise to want to be in just one platform i think with with especially in the automotive world right because things are changing so quickly platforms are going away completely de different platforms are coming out you know, you can't tie yourself to one platform and have it be a sustainable long-term business, right? Right. You know, if it, now that's, it, I say that for us, I don't think that would apply to us. For, for a company that's maybe 30 years old right now that just does Mustang stuff, they're totally fine, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're totally fine. They've got plenty of cars to, to serve and, and customers to serve in that area, but it's different for us. We're, we're not in that category. So 
if you want to serve everybody, uh, you've got to you've got to look at all platforms, and that's really ultimately what I want to do. I I am very interested in business. I'm I'm an entrepreneur. I consider myself uh, interested in business in general, not just cars. So I want to grow this thing to as big as I as I possibly can, and that would require to get into anything and everything. So obviously, you want to pick out platforms that that a lot of people are in, right? Mm-hmm. You want to you go towards platforms that you can do well in and grow with. But yeah, I, I'm not afraid to jump into any platform. I want to. What's the next one on your list, do you think? You know, VW Audi is is one that, that I am interested in, for sure. Well, you know what? That's a good to. point, because you were just saying that S3 was getting a tune from some tuner in Europe, and yeah. uh, that could be a sign of uh, a lack of of coverage for those vehicles in the United States. So that's a good point. It is already a highly served market. It's a different market than, than let's say Mazda Speed or Focus ST or Subaru or anything like that. It's different. It's kind of more closed off. All the flashing systems out there are really, you know, the customizability from a tuning standpoint is not there. That, that sort of changed a little bit when Cobb tuning got into the GTI, but it's such a huge market, right? And so it'd be it'd be crazy to turn, you know, turn your head to it. But that's just one platform. I think VW Audi. I really like Mustang stuff. You know, Mustang. It's interesting because the EcoBoost stuff we know so well, and we could get into the Mustang world through EcoBoost. I don't know how much room there is to go in that. I don't know. I don't know how how well that would go trying to use that as a tool to get into the Mustang world in general. But Mm -hmm. that's another platform I've thought about, you know, the Honda Civic SI that we just bought. I've always loved Hondas. Hondas were kind of my first, you know, when you're 16, who you and I are in the same age group or close (laughs) enough to where you're probably exactly like me. When we were both in high school, it was like Honda, 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 Honda. Yes. But you kind of grow up and other cars have come out and you go, well, you know, I can afford maybe a little bit nicer thing now, or it's not all about just what's cheap to modify like, like Hondas were. Right. So, exactly. um, you know, that's a pretty cool platform to modify anything that you can turn up the boost from the factory without turning a wrench is, is cool. Heck yeah. Oh yeah. It's so funny. I was talking to a friend of mine just the other day about Hondas back when you and I were kids and uh, I, I shouldn't say kids, but, you know, when we were high school age or a little bit after, Hondas weren't just easy to build and and cheap to build. They were also relatively fast. And yeah, no, well, no doubt. Yeah, we didn't have the kind of cars that we have now. We didn't have Nissan Maximas that could run 13 second quarter miles from the factory. We didn't have <laughs> right. Ford F-150 EcoBoost trucks that could run 14s from the factory, you know, stuff like right. that, like a 15 second car from the factory in the late 90s, early 2000s. That was a fast car, a really fast yeah. car. And so, you know what? That's a really good point that you, you bring on. The, the Honda Civic has, has got some sophistication now. And it, like you said, it has this very user friendly turbo platform. That's a good direction to look. I, I like where your head's at. It shows why you've been so successful. It's because you're tuned in to what's going on and you, you know, a good direction when you see it, JP. I like that. And I appreciate that about you. Let us know one more time where people People can find you and your social media and, and everything that Edge is doing. Yeah, so edgeautosport.com is uh, obviously the website and Facebook, uh, Edge Autosport, Edge Autosport on Instagram. It's pretty easy to find us. Anybody that searches for Mazda Speed 3 stuff typically finds us. <laughs> so you can check us out or contact us. We'd love to hear from from anybody. That is awesome, man. I love hearing that. I'm really, really glad to hear that you guys are up and going and doing good and it's always great to talk to you my friend so thanks so much for calling in yeah you bet andy it's been a pleasure and thanks for having me on i appreciate it man absolutely brother and i can't wait to talk to you again we will catch you soon okay all right you got it and of course while you're out there checking out what edge autosport has to offer for your vehicles don't forget to make your way over to boostboostbbq.com. That's where you'll find this episode and all of our past episodes, as well as a lot of cool media that we're doing, photos of things we got going on. So make sure you're going and checking that out. The Facebook page, facebook.com slash boostboostbbq. Instagram is boostboostbbq. Make your way over there. Throw us a like, throw us a comment. And if you get a chance, leave us a review. We always appreciate hearing it, and we always appreciate getting feedback from you guys. So 
Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for telling a friend. And we will see you next time. Boost Booze and Barbecue.